Global viewers, thank you so much for your patience as we kick off part two of our Global Earth Day broadcast. I'm thrilled to have in studio with us today, Kathleen Rogers, president of EarthDay.org. Kathleen, thank you for being here. Tell us just a little bit about what it means for Earth Day today as it relates to Ukraine. Well, we've had a long uh, relationship with Ukraine going back decades. We have many NGOs that we work with. Um, our, our feelings and our, the extraordinary effort that Ukrainians have made to clean up the environment over the last 18 years has just been such a rewarding experience to watch uh, in such a great country. We are particularly pleased uh, that we were able to bring the Deputy Environmental Minister, Irina Subcheck, here with us. Thank you so much for making uh, your time for us and for the panel that will address this incredibly difficult issue, which is environmental crimes that are now occurring every minute in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, the Russian military has fired more than 2,000 missiles into Ukraine. Around 85,000 tons of destroyed Russian military equipment is laying in sites and countryside. According to the State Emergency Service of Ukraine, about 300,000 square kilometers of Ukraine's territory need demining, including explosives installed by Russian troops in forests and on vast areas of arable land in Ukraine, which as a result cannot be used for agriculture. Dozens of Ukrainian nature reserves and national parks have suffered significant damage, such as the destruction of Ramsar sites at the coast of the Azov and Black Seas and in the lower reaches of the Danube and the Dnipro rivers. The Russian military has caused significant damage to water supply, sewerage, and communication systems directly threatening fresh water supplies. UNICEF in Ukraine estimates that up to 6 million people now have no regular access to drinking water. Russians are targeting infrastructure and industrial sites, explosions releasing tons of poisonous chemicals. They are putting oil processing plants on fire that is extremely hard to quench. From the very beginning, the war put the world on the brink of a nuclear disaster. Russian army started off by occupying Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They kept hostage the employees and didn't allow the rotation, damaged the power supply system, which is critical to safety of operations, damaged monitoring and research equipment. They built fortifications and burned grass and bushes in highly contaminated Red Forest. While living, the occupiers stole and damaged 133 radiation sources, which are highly dangerous if handled unprofessionally. The Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is still controlled by the Russian military. This war needs to be stopped as soon as possible, before its cost is too high for the whole humanity. Good evening and warm greetings from Kiev. Today is the 58th day of Russian military aggression in Ukraine. It's 58 days of horror, of tears, of losses of people all over Ukraine. But it is also 58 days of bravery of Ukrainian army and volunteers, of consolidation and support, and of hopes and praise to stop this war. Um, I would like to thank every country and every individual who helps us in fight of the Russian aggression and also provides humanitarian support to our people. Thank you very much. 
as nature of course is also suffering a lot and nature has no borders and it is being also raped and tortured by Russian invasion. Ukraine is a large industrialized country with um, thousands of industrial sites, four nuclear power plants, dozens of dams and other environmentally sensitive objects. As you could hear from the video, um, there were more than 2,000 missiles being uh, issued into Ukraine, as well as countless artillery shells, mines and air bombs. And of course, all this has major damages to infrastructure, but also to the nature. Um, nuclear threat is one of the biggest. Uh, you've heard about Chernobyl exclusion zone, and that's a place where huge uh, nuclear catastrophe happened in 1986. And uh, this place also still has um, nuclear fuel storage facilities and other nuclear waste. And when uh, the first day the Russian troops came into Chernobyl zone, we already fixed the seven times increase in the radioactive pollution in the area due to the heavy machineries uh, bringing up the dust. But actually, when the Russian troops left the place, uh, we learned that they damaged completely the monitoring system for radioactive pollution. They stole 133 hazardous sources of radiation, and they were even digging trenches in the highly contaminated Red Forest. Now Chernobyl is under Ukrainian control, but uh, Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is still under the control of Russian army. And there were also horrible events happening there. They were, uh, they burned an office building to the ground. They shelled the confinement of the first nuclear reactor. And they were also uh, blowing up the explosive on the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. They still have heavy weapons and they also mined them of the Kachovka reservoir nearby. So whatever intended or unintended mistake on or action happens there, it can lead to huge environmental catastrophe. Of course, Ukraine is suffering from many dangerous industrial enterprises, which have been hit with explosions and fires, that's oil depots causing large scale fires, but also other, place, other uh, places. And Russians are also using banned bombs with white phosphorus, which is heat for cities, but also for the nature. Um, I would also like to address the issue of climate change. We still have to calculate the impacts of this war to climate change, but we expect that it will be enormous amount of greenhouse gas emissions, which were embedded in numerous destroyed infrastructure, uh, military equipment and buildings, which now would have to be rebuilt. Uh, but we also expect that the war would have global impacts on climate in a bad sense because financial resources might go to military expenditures as the world is not in peace rather than directed to climate change mitigation and adaptation programs. There are issues of global food supply because one third of Ukrainian territory would not be able to plant agricultural products and we are one of the major suppliers. In a good sense, we hope that many countries all over the world, including my own country, would aim to reduce dependence on fossil fuels as much as possible. And the Russian regime and this war to a large extent is funded with fossil fuel exports to Europe and other countries from Russia. Thank you, uh, Irina. Uh, my name is Carl Brook. Welcome all. I direct international programs at the Environmental Law Institute, and I am president of the Environmental Peacebuilding Association. I will be moderating today's discussion. We have an amazing panel of experts. You just heard from Irina Stavchuk, who is the Deputy Minister of Environmental Protection and Natural Resources of Ukraine for European Integration. Before assuming this role, she was the Deputy Minister of Energy and Environmental Protection of Ukraine. Also joining us today is Stefan Smith, who is a Senior Program Manager with the UN Environment Program, working on response to disasters and conflict. He has a background in international news agency journalism and news analysis in multiple fragile and conflict-affected contexts. Michael Bota is Professor Emeritus of Public Law at the JW Goethe University Frankfurt Main for more than 50 years, he's been an expert in the law of war 
and on environmental law. Among his many posts, he was president of the International Humanitarian Fact-Finding Commission. And Jose Allen is an environmental attorney with 45 years of experience in the private sector, state government, and the U.S. Department of Justice. Jose also served as a commissioner on the UN Compensation Commission, which was created in the aftermath of the 1990-91 Gulf War to require Iraq to pay reparations for damage, including environmental damage, resulting from Iraq's unlawful invasion and occupation of Kuwait. I'd like to start the discussion today by asking our experts, with all the devastation, the horrors, the heartbreak of the war in Ukraine, why are we talking about the environment? Why should we care about environmental damage? <laughs> Stefan, would you like to start? Um, yeah, sure. Um, and good, good evening from Nairobi. Yeah, I think the important thing to stress really is that it's not one or the other. You know, it's we're not talking about humanitarian issues on the one hand and, and environmental issues on the other. It's one of the same thing. You know, when we're talking about the environment, we're talking about livelihoods, we're talking about clean air, we're talking about clean water, safe urban areas, um, public health, food systems, for example. So this is all fundamentally, it's about people. It's about a safe environment in which people can live. And if we're going to be able to address uh, the issues around um, the humanitarian crisis, around the refugee crisis, then that will require a, 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 a robust environmental response. Great. And Michael, uh, um, you've worked on these issues for 50 years, uh, starting with the Vietnam War. Um, what are your perspectives on this? Well, I entirely agree with Stefan. Avoiding and uh, repairing environmental damage means preserving the living conditions, the conditions for a bearable life during and after the conflict. Uh, there is no peace building without uh, uh, restoration uh, or preservation of the environment. And in addition, the right of future generations to live in a decent environment and a healthy environment is at stake. Thank you. Jose? Well, Carl, I'll agree with Stefan's and Michael's comments. The only, the only point that I would add is that concerns about environmental damage have always been present. Uh, we've always had to deal with the aftermath of war and its impact on the environment. I think the main change today has been the recogni recognition that restoration and recovery of the environment is vital and that compensation should be paid by the aggressor to aid those recovery efforts. Thank you, Jose. And Irina, I don't know if you have uh, particular perspectives to add here, you're, you're living this. People want to live in a peaceful country and of course people want to have clean water and to have all the basic clean environment as, as it was already mentioned. Excellent. So, um, following up on Irina's uh, framing, we saw a wide range of environmental impacts of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm wondering from the panelists, are there any other environmental damages that we should be concerned about and why? Well, I I'll start off. I mean, one of the things that we noted in the, in the film uh, that Irina, the deputy minister showed, uh, was the impact of, 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 of unexploded ordnance and landmines uh, placed there. Uh, and while those might tend to be viewed uh, through the lens of post-conflict military operations, they can also be viewed from the perspective of environmental contamination because of the long-term threat that unexploded ordnance and landmines pose to human population. The other thing that we shouldn't overlook is the issue of uh, monitoring uh, public health and performing medical screenings to assess uh, and combat the increased health risks that flow from environmental damage. So I, I think one of the important points you, you make there, Jose, is that we don't truly know what all the impacts are. 
we, we, we don't know at this time, and that's going to take the process, and it, and it emphasizes the importance of doing proper monitoring and assessment, both on an ongoing basis and post-conflict, to really understand uh, what the full scope of impacts are. Excellent. And um, Michael or Stefan, would you like to well, add in? Uh, there is uh, there are a few things. Uh, there are uh, environmental damages uh, which uh, are, so to say, typical for any armed conflict. It's industrial pollution uh, caused by attacks on uh, industrial installations. Um, not to forget uh, ammunition storage, which is a military objective, of course, but uh, the environmental damages, the toxic pollution caused by destroying uh, ammunition storage are a, a civilian collateral damage, uh, which has to be taken into account, which is uh, very serious. Um, and another point is, um, attacks on uh, housing areas, uh, depending on the uh, building techniques which had been used, um, the rubble caused by the destructions of housing is toxic waste, uh, which uh, causes problems. And we have seen that uh, in a number of conflicts uh, around the world, uh, unfortunately. And uh, last but not least, I would like also to draw attention to the question of loss of habitats, of loss of protected areas, which brings into the picture what I said earlier, uh, the rights of future generations. Thank you. And uh, particularly, the I, I want to flag the damage to housing and other buildings, many of which uh, have asbestos in them. So yes. it's, not, it's not just as simply a matter of removing the rubble and starting over. You have to figure out how to manage the... Uh, the, the, the ongoing health threats of asbestos. There's been a lot of misinformation, and disinformation about the war in Ukraine and claims of fake news. One of the first things we must do is to get a reliable assessment of the environmental impacts. Stefan, you work with the UN Environment Program, which has worked on, they've, they've done post-conflict environmental assessments uh, in dozens of countries going back to the Kosovo conflict in 1999. Could you maybe share with us some of the experiences and lessons from post-conflict environmental assessments? Why is it important that the UN Environment Program do such an assessment in Ukraine? And what does this look like in practice? Yeah, I think, yeah, I th I think that the, the first thing which is really important to stress is that there's such an enormous amount of really important work being conducted at the moment, both by Ukrainian authorities, by Ukrainian NGOs, by international civil society groups, as well as by the UN and other international inter, international governmental organizations. And I think, you know, what we're seeing at the moment is possibly unprecedented is that we're seeing a really a huge scale of remote environmental assessment and field environmental assessment at such an early stage in a conflict. And I think this comes back to a point which has been raised uh, here is already, which is, this is really perhaps a turning point in the level of attention around environment in armed conflicts. And I think that's, that's, that's a very positive step. I think really the key challenge in Ukraine is really going to be around how do you consolidate and prioritize this information? How do you filter it? How do you then develop targeted field assessments on remediation and mitigation? And then also, and I think this is really where UNEP can assist. I mean, this is, this is about helping the key parties and in particular the government of Ukraine to, to have the best information possible to make sure that they're supported in trying to collate this information and to deal with these hazards and to really then have a, a, a really a solid base of information in which they can direct their efforts as well. In addition then what we can also support on as well and what we what we will, we will be supporting on is, is actual field assessments themselves, uh, laboratory analysis for example, um, the provision of specific technical expertise, for example, it's already been mentioned, the complexity of dealing with this asbestos in urban waste, um, and also remote sensing and, and satellite imaging as well. Thank you. And uh, Stefan, you alluded to a number of organizations that are doing this sort of assessment. I'm wondering if the other panelists might be able to speak to the role of these other organizations in 
assessing environmental damage both during and after conflict. Michael, would you like to start? Yes, indeed. Um, following up on what Stefan said, uh, there are two aspects uh, relating to fact-finding concerning environmental damages. Uh, the first question is who did what? Who pulled the trigger? Um, which then also relates to criminal law. And the other thing is, uh, the other aspect is, what is the environmental impact? Where is the environmental problem? Uh, how can we evaluate uh, environmental damage? So the effect and both aspects are important. Uh, and we need fact finding on both aspects. Now, uh, coming to the practice, um, uh, Stefan already mentioned a very important point, uh, and this is civil society organizations uh, who are doing fact-finding, uh, mainly on their own initiative. Uh, in relation to the uh, Ukraine uh, conflict, we've had uh, such uh, fact-finding in the Donbass area, where uh, since uh, 2014, uh, the environment is uh, heavily damaged. Uh, and uh, I uh, admire some of those uh, uh, activists who did fact finding at the risk of their life. Uh, so I think this is a, a very important point. Uh, the uh, uh, NGOs, civil society organizations acting on their own initiative. But on the other hand, uh, there are governmental organizations, and uh, Stefan represents one of them, uh, perhaps the most important one, but uh, there are others. Uh, when we get closer to the humanitarian aspect, it's the United Nations Human Rights Council or the Office of the Coordinator of the Humanitarian Affairs. Uh, we have already in place uh, a mission by the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe. The OSCE was just um, submitted. I have read recently a report. There's a three-person commission. I have not yet uh, seen that report, but this is an important aspect. So um, uh, there is a diversity of organizations which are in, involved. And uh, I think... Uh, uh, there is no point of centralization. Uh, different organizations have different potentials and uh, uh, they should all go ahead. Um, this uh, brings me to a last point um, because you mentioned uh, my former capacity as chair of the International Unitary Fact-Finding Commission. That is an institution set up by uh, the additional protocols to uh, the Geneva uh, Conventions, so there's a treaty-based body uh, which uh, has the task, if asked by the parties, uh, to inquire any violation of international humanitarian law, and that, of course, includes um, uh, causing environmental damage which is unlawful under uh, international humanitarian law. That commission um, I'm no longer part of it, but uh, I know it, um, has, uh, has, uh, has offered its uh, services uh, to the parties to the conflict. Um, so far, I haven't heard of any reactions to this offer. Thank you, Thank you Michael. And Jose, would you like to uh, share some of your experiences from the UNCC? Sure, certainly as a, uh, as a commissioner with the UNCC in evaluating claims for environmental damage uh, resulting uh, from the invasion and occupation of Kuwait, uh, one of the central issues that we needed to grapple with uh, was the question of the baseline. What was the baseline prior to the uh, environmental damage that was caused by the conflict? And in that context, the importance of having good monitoring and assessment being able to, 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 to measure the increment of damage and be able to prove that increment of damage uh, becomes very, very uh, important to any uh, compensation that might be provided for that damage. 
for, for some areas, it's going to be obvious that w the change in baseline that occurred. You have, a, you, have an, you have an urban area with apartment buildings, office buildings, and now it's been reduced to rubble. It becomes more difficult when you're dealing with areas that have been previously heavily industrialized, perhaps contaminated from those prior historical industrial activities, and there it becomes more challenging to establish the baseline and, and, and evaluate the increment of damage, but it's no less important to do. Thank you, Jose. And that's a great segue to uh, the next question, which is shifting gears from impacts to action. And uh, the question is, what can be done about the environmental impacts? And I think there are two broad categories. One is environmental remediation and containing the damage, and then restoration. And then questions of liability. And I'd like to focus first on the uh, containment and remediation of environmental damage. Stefan Yunup has, for now more than two decades, uh, um, worked to restore uh, the environment in conflict-affected countries. Based on your experience, what are the priorities for environmental recovery in Ukraine? And what are the typical patterns of post-war environmental reconstruction that we tend to see? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, 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 I think it's a difficult question to answer because it, we're still uh, in what is an active conflict at the moment, and it's a continuing conflict. Um, so at this stage, it, it's difficult to kind of identify any specific priorities. At the same time as well is that what we've seen is, as has been mentioned, a heavily industrialized society, which has undergone sustained heavy attacks. Uh, we've seen significant urban damage. Um, if there's a significant problem with unexploded ordnance, um, damage to industrial facilities, chemical storage facilities, extractive sites, um, deforestation, uh, impacts on agricultural land. And I think all of this, you know, we've seen a large scope of various themes and perhaps components of themes that we've seen in other places all around the world, but perhaps all wrapped into one country. Um, and with also with a quite a challenging and large geographical scope as well. So I think one of the issues, I think, rather than at this stage talking about priorities is to really highlight the extensive um, scope of damage and the extensive geographical scope of the damage that has taken place taken place. I think in terms of priorities, I think obviously it's it's maintaining um, a very robust monitoring process from all of these partners, making sure that assessments are done quickly, accurately, and of high quality. And and this is really the priority of this is has to be is to make sure that any recovery efforts and, and even when thinking forward to reconstruction and redevelopment planning is to make sure that this is founded on solid baselines and accurate baselines as well so that the reconstruction efforts don't actually exacerbate some of the environmental problems. And I think this has been the case in many conflicts before, is that environmental recovery work or hazard, hazard remediation tends to be a little bit quick and dirty to some extent. The environment, environmentalists tend to come into the show perhaps a little bit late, and then it goes back to business as usual, which is very carbon intensive and very destructive as well. Thank you. Jose, would you like to share a few perspectives from the UNCC experience? Certainly. Um, I, I think that for the international community, um, a focus on providing financial support for monitoring and assessment and restoration efforts are as important as providing financial support uh, for economic recovery or infrastructure rebuilding. Um, and that needs to be part of any international effort uh, that is made is to ensure that there's adequate funding. I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the issues that we faced uh, with the UNCC uh, is the question of providing early funding uh, so that affected governments did have the capability of carrying out the monitoring assessment because if you're going to make a claim for compensation and you don't have the ability to establish the nature of the damage and extent of damage that you've suffered, uh, your claim is probably not going to proceed uh, or succeed. Uh, so you have to make sure that the funding is there to enable the affected entities to undertake the necessary 
uh, assessment and ultimately the remediation that becomes necessary afterwards. Great points. And I'd like to shift now uh, to the question of accountability. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and how it's undertaken the war generated widespread agreement that Russia has violated numerous provisions of international law. The challenge, though, is how to hold Russia and the relevant leaders accountable. Usual mechanisms such as the UN Security Council, which was instrumental in holding Iraq liable for environmental and other damage arising from the 1990-91 invasion of Kuwait, are problematic because Russia holds a veto power. So, to the panel, what can countries in the international community do to hold Russia and its leaders civilly or criminally accountable for the environmental harms associated with this invasion? Michael, would you like to start? Well, this is a great field. Uh, I'll try to describe the various aspects one over the other. Let me start with criminal responsibility of individuals involved in the commission of crimes. Uh, the essential crime uh, that has to be said in the beginning uh, is attacks on the, civi the civilian population, uh, which can be targeting civilians uh, in the first place, which is a war crime, or by attacking military objectives causing disproportionate damage to the civilian population. And both aspects um, involve protection of the environment. The environment is essentially civilian uh, and damaging the environment in this context uh, is a war crime for that reason. Now, uh, Coming to war crimes, uh, we first think, and that has already been mentioned, uh, uh, of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the uh, cr International Criminal Court is has jurisdiction uh, on war crimes committed on the territory of Ukraine, regardless of the fact that um, Russia is not a party uh, to the ICC statute. This is different uh, as regards uh, the crime of aggression, uh, which would involve a duty to pay damages for any, anything which follows, but this crime of aggression requires that uh, the state uh, of uh, the perpetrator is a party to the conflict. Uh, now, um, the uh, International Criminal Court has started an investigation uh, concerning the situation, uh, but the second very difficult problem is uh, to single out uh, specific uh, suspects, uh, which is also a question of fact-finding, and I understand uh, the organizations doing fact-finding are aware of this problem, and uh, from time to time one reads information that this is going on. Um, the ICC is not the only institution which uh, is entitled to prosecute war crimes. On the basis of, of universal jurisdiction, any state can is entitled to do that. And I know that in a number of states, not only in the state of the victim, Ukraine, of course, but also in a number of states, uh, and this includes uh, Germany and Switzerland, uh, there are investigations uh, going on. Um, wherever uh, this ends is difficult to know, but uh, if I sh could give advice to Russian uh, officers, be careful where you travel. Uh, you may be caught in a state which has a, an attentive uh, prosecution. Now, uh, turning to the question of... Uh, reparation of damages. Uh, this is uh, difficult as there is no international court which has jurisdiction on the matter. Um, 
There is, of course, one precedent, uh, which is the US-Iranian uh, claims tribunal, which had the task of sorting out the consequences of the hostage-taking case. Um, this requires an agreement, uh, but I think it's not, un it's not entirely unrealistic because uh, after a while, both parties might find an, int might find an interest uh, in clarifying the consequences of this war, including the consequences of sanctions. Uh, on one side or Sorry, Michael, the other. Michael, we're, we're running a little short on time. Yes, sure. Um, wondering if, uh, uh, I'd like to shift for a moment on uh, the civil liability to Jose uh, and his experiences with uh, the UNCC. Well, well, well certainly, I, look, the, the critical issue is where's the money going to come from? Uh, it's, it's one thing to, to assert uh, and to establish that the aggressor is liable for damages. The other question is, is well, how are you going to get access? I do think, uh, given the, the issues that you pointed out, uh, Carl, with trying to establish some kind of international tribunal now, similar to the UNCC, I think the use of, of foreign assets that are held by national government governments provides a mechanism uh, for there to be a fund uh, available to pay compensation. To my mind, though, the critical thing is that whatever form any tribunal takes, it needs to be one uh, that is efficient, uh, speedy, and fair. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like at the end, but it seems to me that those are the key features that have to be in place uh, the Iranian Claims Tribunal, while uh, important, became very protracted and is still very protracted because of the elaborate procedures that were involved. So I think looking forward, um, we need to make sure that whatever we do can operate efficiently and quickly and get compensation to the victims and affected governments as quickly as possible. Uh, Michael, do you want to have a quick rebuttal or follow on, particularly no, uh, as it relates uh, to frozen uh, I, assets? Uh, I entirely agree uh, that the money is there, but uh, access to that money uh, poses some questions of uh, uh, sovereign immunity because this is state money. And uh, normally, this is protected by the rule of state immunity. Now, um, uh, there are recent developments that's worthwhile inquiring into that, uh, that uh, in this case, uh, where the consequences uh, of uh, a violation of fundamental um, um, norms of international law uh, are at stake, uh, it is uh, possible to argue that in this case, uh, the duty of states uh, to put an end to a violation of uh, imperative norms of international law uh, takes precedence uh, over the traditional rule of state immunity. Um, but uh, there is a legal fight uh, which has to be fought. Thank you. And Irina, I'm wondering if you might be able to comment on what the Ukrainian government is uh, thinking about or doing in this area, criminally or civilly? Yeah, so Ukrainian government uh, civil, in a civic law is uh, uh, collecting all the information and recording all the cases to be able to put it in the International Court of Justice. Uh, in terms of environmental damage, that's, uh, as I learned today, also many more information, and thank you for sharing these uh, ideas, but uh, we also have challenges in understanding how to assess what kind of methodologies use. Um, we have uh, challenges to quickly assess some sites because the war is ongoing and it's not always that we have access to the places. But we also see that the, the scale of uh, impacts in Ukraine and uh, the international legal system in place doesn't really fit. So we have to work together to find out new legal developments to be able to, to resolve this also for the hopefully not existing future cases, but also that Ukraine becomes precedent of um, 
bring in uh, environmental damages, uh, like making aggressor accountable also for environmental damages. And uh, very much looking forward to cooperate with all of the international organizations, scientific organizations, legal organizations to help us on this process. I'd like to close by asking each of you what, in one sentence, a short sentence, what should be the priorities of Ukraine and the international community in addressing environmental damage caused by Russia's invasion? Stefan. Okay, so I'll try and be, 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 be quick. Um, I think, you know, look, the scale of the destruction that we're seeing is so big and, and, and that in itself presents a challenge of perhaps almost dealing with a, with a blank slate. And I think the overall message is that I think everybody needs to think big. Um, the political will for positive recovery is clearly there in Ukraine. Um, there is a requirement to support that. The need to think beyond just making Ukraine safe again and just really start to think big. Imagine the national, the regional, the global potential of, of a green economic recovery. That was a long sentence. Well done. <laughs> Michael, you. Well, a credible uh, and reliable fact finding will be key. Uh, second sentence, there is a task for the international community at large, uh, a duty of solidarity, providing help, which means finance and expertise, which is there around the world and should concentrate on restoring the environment of Ukraine. Thank you. Jose. I have a very short sentence. I echo Stefan's and Michael's comments. Uh, I think those are the key priorities that we need to focus on. Two sentences, sorry. Serena? Uh, Ukrainian people, and it was also stated by the president and the, by the government of Ukraine, we want to have the green recovery to build it on the low carbon and green technologies. So we would very much appreciate cooperation on expertise and on financial uh, support to make it possible. Thank you very much. Thank you all for sharing your expertise today. This is a critically important issue from Ukraine to Yemen to Colombia to Myanmar and many other countries. I thank those who are watching the show for taking time to be with us here today. And Washington, back to you. Thank you, Carl. And thank you to our speakers for having this conversation. Arena, please stay safe. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with our global audience today. Much appreciated. And thank you to Kathleen Rogers and EarthDay.org for co-hosting today's DC program with us. Moving on, we are going to now turn from the impacts of war to the impacts of agriculture on our planet's health.